the Cellcast is recorded in front of a live streaming audience. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Cellcast. Joining me today is a man who, well, he just likes a bo- he just likes having his box of dead lizards. Welcome, Jacob. Yes, yes, yes. Why, thank you. Let me introduce our co-host, the man who decided he wanted to go jumping across rooftops with a cat. Welcome, Drew. Unfortunately, unlike the guy in this movie, the results were not that good. Mm. I cannot parkour. <laughs> He can park ball. No, I can't. <laughs> there was no red paint for me to grab onto. Because oh. if y'all have never played Mirror's Edge, it was red surfaces and that, unlike oh, every other game where yeah, it's yeah. yellow surfaces That's that right. you can do stuff with. I remember something like that. But anyway. Yes. Yeah, we are reviewing our first french film i believe though yeah. jacob says we did a different one and i can't remember which film that would be oh we'll, pro- we'll probably think about the middle of probably middle, middle of doing this. i know it's not oh, paprika. Yeah, that film. i know it's not paprika because that no, was japanese that's japanese and i cannot think of what other one we did we've done british yes we've done british and we've done of course we've done a lot of american a lot. and we've done british japanese american and i think this is our first and we have done italian On that note, <laughs> on that note, <laughs> giving myself enough room to edit that out. <laughs> but yeah, uh, so yeah, we're reviewing tonight a cat in Paris. Yes, or as I like to call him, based on his uh, the way he looks with his black fur and red stripes, Shadow the Hedge Cat. Shadow the Hedge Cat, because he looks a lot like Shadow the Hedgehog. Agreed. But any, he's, he's just missing the uh, air-powered uh, rollerblades. I, I think rollerblades. I think Usher from the most recent Super Bowl that came out was. I was year. barely even watching his thing when we were there, because it's like I apparently don't know any of these songs. Wow, I know I, I, I knew some. I knew a lyric every once in a while. So yeah, probably a chorus that maybe I heard on the mm-hmm. radio somewhere. Yeah, but I'm listening to it. It's like, wow, I didn't realize this was all this guy, and I didn't realize how much I didn't like this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah. Yes. Moving on. Yeah, moving right along. Dooga doom, digga doom. Are you ready to jump into the spoiler free section? Yes. <sighs> Certified fresh and spoiler free. This is my first viewing. It was Jacob's pick in this one. Mm-hmm. But uh, I actually did really enjoy this. I mean, it's only an hour long, which surprised me. I was hmm. expecting this to be like an hour and a half for yes. some reason. Mm-hmm. I guess because so many animated ones are an hour and a half and you don't normally see hour-long movies at all yes the only one i can think of off the top of my head was uh land before time it was only about nine uh it was only about an hour but uh i enjoyed this mm-hmm. the animation is spectacular agreed uh i thought the acting was very well done of course we watched the english dub mm-hmm. uh but yeah i thought the movie was good and i think pretty much if you have any interest in just the general art of animation Go watch this. It's actually brilliant, in yeah. my opinion. Yeah, it's available on Tubi for free. Yeah. So, yeah, go go enjoy this. Be like, because it's a very unique style because we actually looked prior uh, post-show. It's more, pre-show. Pre-show, sorry. Pre-show. It's more like, it's more of a more cubism style. Ish. Ish. Impressionism, in a way. Style, because it's... We had, we had differing opinions. Yes. <laughs> when, when you have two artists, we're going to have two different opinions at all about everything, for the most part. Of course, I look at it and go, "Oh yeah, that's that graphic design from the from the early 1900s." Yes. Yay. <laughs> yeah. That that's the that's, that eventually moves into the graphic design po- of the posters we see in World War II. That's mm-hmm. mostly what I remember. Yeah, agreed. Because that's I had to know that part of the art styles. Not what did Picasso mean? When, no, when Picasso? No. It was uh, what Rem- Da Vinci? Rembrandt. Either way. Yeah. What did any of these artists mean referring to any of these art styles when they drew the line this way and go, that's just where the pen fell. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I am, I am a very practical artist and thinking any 
pretty much any kind of symbolism is probably put there by there's right there's symbolism intended by the artists themselves but mm. a lot of the art symbolism people see is put there by the audience in my opinion yeah that's true but either way <laughs> Uh, I, I do. I did enjoy this film. I actually was surprised how much I enjoyed this film. Yes. Because uh, you, you, like I said, you picked this one, mm -hmm. and it started and immediately. I saw the art style. And went, oh, it's one of these. Mm -hmm. And I kind of was, I kind of backed off a little, <laughs> kind, you know, because like, okay, I, I'm gonna have to take this with a grain of salt. And the, but then as it got going, it was like, okay, I'm getting into this. I'm getting into this. Uh, but yeah, I enjoyed it. You should give this a watch if you haven't seen it. Yes. I so agree. that's my spoiler free thoughts. Yes. Uh, so again, my first time viewing it, because I remember seeing um, this came out in 2010 or at least it was released in America around 2011. Because uh, the movie was originally, originally released in 2000, 2010. So I remember seeing something about this. And then when it comes up to. It's like, hey, you need to pick movies for, you know, the lineup. And I saw it was like, you know, unique films that mm -hmm. came out. And I was like, oh, A Cat in Paris. Is the movie really about the cat? Not really. I was expecting it to be about the cat. Yeah. Which it really is. But it wasn't, so. No. But I thoroughly, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed this film tremendously. Uh, the animation-wise, it was beautiful. Had a really great, interesting story. There's really not a whole lot of movies in this movie to complain about. It has like great talent behind it. Um, uh, in front of the camera and behind the camera or behind the microphone in this mm -hmm. case. And it's just, it's, it's a wonder, it's beautiful to watch. Be able to you know, go watch it, go watch it on Tubi, it's Tubi, uh, which is free and just go enjoy it. But like, there's a ton of very interesting foreign films over there. If you're interested in animation that is, you know, not Japanese or American. So yeah, highly recommend this film. Great film. Well, let's go ahead and jump into our spoiler filled thoughts and we'll get to talking yeah, about yes. this good. The following is a spoiler filled review for the film, a cat in Paris. Listener discretion is advised. Meow. A cat in Paris, or as it's known in Fran in French, Un vie de cat. I probably said that wrong, but literally it translates to a cat's life, mm -hmm. which honestly makes more sense yeah. than, than the American name. Yeah, I agree. But c'est la vie. Tu sais. Omelette du fromage. It's the only other French I know. Fair. And I got that from Dexter's lab. Of course. This movie was written and directed by Elaine Gagnol, who originally, who also directed Phantom Boy, along with, uh, uh, also directed by Jean Loup Felicioli, okay, who also directed The Cat's Regret, which, as far as I could tell, is not related to this film. The Cat's Regret. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. It was also written by Jacques Remy Girard. Hmm. Okay. Getting into the cast, Jean was played by Marsha Gay Harden, mm -hmm. who in the movie Flubber, the one with Robin Williams in it from the 90s that yes. we probably actually watched. Yes. She played Dr. Sarah Jean Reynolds, hmm. who I don't remember who that character is. However, we'll know this name. Claudine, our villainess, mm -hmm. not that you knew that at the beginning, No. was played by Angelica Houston, who played Morticia Adams in the 80s uh, Adams Family movie. That's right. Was it 80s oh, or 90s? 80s or not? Maybe 90s. I don't yeah, quite remember. Early 90s. Mm -hmm. I know it's not the original show and I know it's not the new animated stuff. Yes. It's those. Yes. Nico was voiced by Steve Bloom. Yes. AKA Spike Spiegel from mm -hmm. Cowboy Bebop. Victor Costa was played by JB Blank. And in Mortal Kombat 11, hmm. the newest uh, game in that series, he played Kano. Really? Mm-hmm. Zoe, with her one line, was played by Lauren Weintraub. And in something called Bird Boy, The Forgotten Children, she played Dinky. Okay. That's about the only thing I can find. Interesting. Lucas 
was played by Matthew Modine. And he played Private Joker in Full Metal Jacket. Hmm. Mr. Baby was played by Mike Pollock, who is the current voice outside of the movies for Dr. Ivo Eggman Robotnik. Oh, that makes sense. You can kind of hear it now. Mr. Bean was played by Philippe Hartman, who was played a Harbor employee in X-Men Apocalypse. Okay. I've seen that one. Mr. Frog was played by Greg Gregory Cupoli, and he played Stan the Mailman in Just Add Magic. Hmm. If you can't tell, I have some hard times with this. And no. Mr. Potato was played by Mark Thompson, who played Bresson in Lupin the Third, the First. Ah. Guess how many Kingdom Hearts connections we have? Hmm. 2010, 2011. Um, four? Lower. Two. Yes. And yes, I did have to go to Smash Brothers. Ah, uh, okay. Kristen Rutherford was additional voices both in A Cat in Paris and in Kingdom Hearts. Hmm. And Mark Thompson, who played Mr. Potato in this. Hmm. I really wish he was playing Mr. Potato Head in that Kingdom Hearts 3, but because that would be funny. However, that, that would be funny, yes. However, in Super Smash Brothers, he plays the Pokemon. Kurim and the Alolan Executor. Oh. Hmm. Or Executor, I think Executor. is actually how you pronounce that. Yes. So yeah, that's what I've got in info and stuff. No. No. That's what I have on the cast list. What yes. do you have in info and stuff? Yes. Uh, so info and stuff. IMDb is a 6.4 out of 10. I could not find information for Rotten Tomatoes, so sorry there. Uh, it's available to watch on Tubi. Uh, production was... Again, these are a lot of French words, so I apologize if I mix, mix them. No. We are all mixing, messing up the French words yes. tonight. We apologize yeah. to our Canadian brethren north of us and our French friends Listen. over on the other side of the pond. Yes. And in the, and our southern friends in Brazil. Yes. Like, they speak Portuguese. Portuguese. Yeah. My bad. <laughs> are those who speak French in New Any, Orleans? Wherever you speak French, French. we apologize. Yes. Our French is bad. Yeah. In my defense, I have no French heritage. <laughs> Jacob, anyway. I can't. I don't know. Anyways, um, production was by Fola Meja, Luna Anime, Anima, Anime. Might be anima, probably. Anima, Anime, Luna Man. Well, yeah, Anime has moved past Japan to be a general term for cartoons. Yeah. But anyway. Uh, let's see. Serious cartoons. Yes, serious cartoons. La Mer, Digital Anime, French 3 Cinema, Rol, uh, Rolna Al, uh, Alba Cinema, RTBF, distributed by, now these are the distributors in the different, different countries, where America was distributed by G-Kids. Probably the easiest name to pronounce. Yes. <laughs> You're not kidding. So in French, uh, it's Gabelacook Films. Let's see. In Belgium and Nor uh, Netherlands, it was Benflick, Benflick, Benflick Film Distributor. In uh, Switzerland, is Argo Films. And here in the United States, it is... G kids. All right. Runtime was 64 minutes. The release dates. Uh, its first re its first release was October 14th, 2010. And it was first played at the St. Guablen Sina Junior Film Festival. Then uh, on the same day, and uh, not the same day, but a month later, on December 15th of 2010, was in Belgium, France, and uh, Netherlands. And, and then on December 22nd, in Switzerland. Box office. Uh, here in the United States, uh, that's the only ones I could find mm -hmm. for this film, because apparently got a, a, a theatrical release here. I can't find anything else in this film, so this is all we've got. Let's see. It never gave me a budget. 
so its opening weekend was on June 3rd, 2012 here in the United States, here in the United States. Uh, it grossed 30, $34,000 34, $34, and change. Its uh, gross here in the United States and Canada was $309,973,000. Its worldwide gross was $2 million. Uh, there is no info. There's no release. No information. I was available for home release, nor any sequel information. So that is all I have for you on info and stuff. All righty. Getting into the summary. A black cat with red stripes with leads a double life. During the night, he accompanies a cat burglar named Nico, who calls him Mr. Cat, who performs heists to steal jewels. During the day, he lives with a girl named Zoe, who calls him Dino. Zoe, who lost her voice after the loss of her father, has become distant from her mother, uh, Jean, who works as a, as a police superintendent and is looked after by a nanny named Claudine. Mm. Nico gives, gives Dino a fish-shaped bracelet, which he passes on to Zoe. At the police station, Jean briefs her colleagues on protecting the Colossus of Nairobi statue which cost her husband his life at the hands of the notorious Victor Costa. Victor Costa intends to have another go at the statue while it is being moved with help from his codenamed accomplices, Mr. Bebe, Mr. Baby, mm. Mr. Hullet, AKA Mr. Bean, Mr. Granuli, Gr Grinwell, sorry, I don't know my French, Mr. Frog, and Mr. Potato, AKA Mr. Potato. Back at home, Jean takes interest in the fish-shaped bracelet and brings it to her colleague, Lucas. Lucas deduces that the bracelet matches up with burgled items from Rue Muffetard. Uh, that night, Zoe sneaks out of her house and follows Dino. She spies Victor's lot and finds Claudine is working for Victor and has been gaining insight on police movements. Zoe is spotted but is rescued by Nico. Nico takes Zoe to hide in the zoo, but Victor's gang picks up her trail. Zoe escapes in a boat. Lucas finds a lead on the robberies trailing directly to Nico's residence. When Nico returns to find Zoe at his place, he is arrested by Jean and Lucas, presumably having kidnapped Zoe. Presumably he having, yeah. Jean leaves Zoe in Claudine's custody and goes with Lucas to find Victor. Unable to convince Jean that Lucas of, and Lucas of Zoe's predicament, Nico escapes in order to find Zoe. Jean is, is able to confirm that Nico's claim about Zoe is true. Claudine has taken Zoe to Costa's house, where she is locked away. Thanks to Claudine's perfume, however, Dino follows the scent and leads Nico to the house. Nico is able to whisk Zoe away after he cuts the power and dons his night goggles. Jean pursues Nico and Zoe to Notre Dame. Nico falls while trying to mislead Victor, but is saved by Jean, who has just arrived at the scene. As Victor captures Zoe, Jean, with Nico and Dino, come to the rescue. Nico has to save Dino when Victor pushes the cat over the edge of a nearby crane, leaving Jean to comfort Victor, to confront Victor, sorry. Plucking up her courage, Jean saves her daughter and strikes Victor, putting him in a hallucinatory trance. Before Jean can help Victor, the gang's leader swings from the crane, to which he imagines is the Colossus of Nairobi, but falls to his death to a truck below. The rest of the gang, including Claudine, are arrested and Zoe regains her voice. Nico reforms himself, gives up thievery, and becomes a member of the family. Not that they actually said that. Mm -hmm. While Dino becomes the it's household implied. pet. Nico gives Jean a snow globe with the Cathedral of Notre Dame in it as a Christmas present. Getting into the trivia for this. The film was one of a number of movies that were in competition at the 2012 Academy Awards that was related to France or French culture in some way. The mm. films including The Artist, 2011, Hugo, 2000, um, they're all 2011. Mm -hmm. Hugo, Midnight in Paris, The Adventures of Tintin, Puss in Boots, uh, Rise of the Planet of the Apes, and, of course, A Cat in Paris. Interestingly, though, there was no French film nominated by for the Best Foreign Film Academy Award in 2012. Mm. When code names are assigned, one of the men is called Mr. Hullet. Hmm. This is a reference to the character that was created and portrayed by Jacques Tati, who Rowan Atkinson cites as an influence for his creation of Mr. Bean, hmm. which is why that character is known as Mr. Bean in our version. That makes sense. 
In the 2012 interview with Animation World Network, Elaine Gagnol spoke about the importance of hand drawn and the hand drawn animation technique for the film. The animation is handmade on paper with erasers and pencils. I'm afraid that we are some kind of dinosaurs of animated movies. Hand drawn animation is kind of a tradition at Fulimaji. We use computers for the line tests and coloring process, the editing, etc. But until now, we keep on drawing on paper. Even the lights on the characters are hand drawn, which is demanding a great amount of time and work for the, from the coloring team. It is also an artistic choice. We are very fond of the sensitivity of the hand work. We even enjoy some of the flaws. As long as we can feel that there is someone behind the drawing on the screen, life is not perfect, unlike the computers. Hmm. And that's all I've got for the trivia for this. Nice. What is your first like for the film? My first like, like you, like normal in these reviews, is gonna be the animation. The animation is like is so unique because they use a, such a unique art style, mm -hmm. which we've kind of determined it might be more of a cube, cubis, cubism impressionism. Something, something like along that. those lines. Be like, you might be like, no, it's this. Be like, mm -hmm. light up the com light up the commentary comments section. Yes, tell us how stupid we are for not un obviously understanding which type of art style this is. Yeah, because neither one of us really could agree. <laughs> yeah, be like, if if you know what kind of art style this is, please let us know down mm -hmm. in the comment sections wherever you're listening or watching this. And uh, so yeah, be like you be like it, the animation's very fluid. It's got this kind of a rubbery kind of feel. Or it's like almost like a yeah, it's got a rubber kind of feel. It's like all the characters walk like they're like they're floating, and uh, kind of like, kind of reminiscent of like how mm -hmm. animation used to be before they did rotoscoping or uh, like live trace or whatever, or computers were involved. Like you had this very fluid, rubbery kind of feel of a person, uh, like uh, arcing back to like some of Disney's very early shorts. Where mm -hmm. the characters kind of walked with a with a wobble and felt like they were made of like a, a rubber band or something like that. Yeah, the way these characters walk and the way they interact and their 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 expressions, you really don't get a whole. You get full face express be like, but the the art style is kind of middle uh, minim, uh, minimalistic in a way, mm -hmm. but it's very expression exp, a very expressionism very expression is in its uh, execution. So I'd be mean, like, I just, I love the animation in this. It's so, well, it's different, it's unique, and it gives you uh, a deeper appreciation for art in a way, mm -hmm. in a way, definitely if you are an artist, if you are a artist. That's my like, that's my first like, the art, the, or the animation of the art. My first like for this film actually kind of dovetailing off of yours. Okay. Yeah, it is the art for this. The animation in this is so creative in places. Mm. The, the one that impressed me the most, though, was when they shut the lights off at uh, Victor Costa's house. Oh, I love that. Love most that. of... I, most of the time, whether it's american european or mm -hmm. japanese animation they still do the eyeballs in the darkness gag yes it's not that it's a bad gag mm -hmm. but it is the most overdone gag agreed this they did it a bit differently they actually drew white outlines for the characters mm -hmm. which that by itself is very creative because you still get to see what's going on yes. without it being without obviously the characters being able to see what's going on it does really it's really cool watching um not nico uh, nico. nico nico uh going around them in doing his cat burglary stuff yes and, and in the dark which was in, which i thought was mm. very very cool but the part that i thought was the coolest was the effect when one of the uh the criminals finally uh gets his lighter to light oh. and you get that glow of actual color mm -hmm. but but where where that, that color fades back to the the black and white mm -hmm. outlines i was like okay if there was not proof <laughs> that because admittedly i did not do a lot of research prior to doing the regular research for this mm -hmm. but i was watching knowing you know because it had touted itself as hand-drawn uh in on the 2b description mm -hmm. and i remember thinking okay that's proof there that computers were involved <laughs> because 
while you can do that mm -hmm. <laughs> in uh, cell animation or in, in, in traditional cell animation style, that's a very hard thing to do. It's almost more of an editing trick, but here it's done so stinking well. Uh, agreed. Uh, it had to have been uh, it had to have been done digitally in that, mm. or at least the coloring done digitally, because it's very obvious that there's only one set of lines. It's just the lines are colored differently between the two sections, and then of course you've got that nice cool fade there. Uh, and they do that a couple more times in that segment before finally they get back out into the sunlight yeah, or the starlight or you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, but that, that those moments there were just so stinking cool from an animation nerd mm -hmm. point of view, because it's just not how we're used to seeing them animate dar uh, absolute darkness before. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's my first like. My second like is going to focus more, more going to focus on characters and it's the goons. Yeah, the the goons are absolutely hysterical. Well, let me back up first. Like first watching the film, it's like, oh great, we got these goofy, idiotic uh, henchmen or goons. Mm -hmm. And the more you progress into the story, the more you progress into the the uh, the narrative, it's like, wow, these characters might be buffoons, but they're really funny. Be like, they even take they take the spotlight away from the boss and put it on themselves, and just every scene they're in, it just makes every scene golden if it's just them being the buffoons they are and the the line reads the everything the animation on these guys are just great wonderful like w again what a filmation this film and overall just a, a a great time watching these buffoons goons be buffoons and uh just make uh just make a mess of every scene they're in or uh what was the uh Mr. Frog Mr. Yeah. Frog has to go after the, the 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 girl and the cat, and he's like, "Oh yeah, when, when what why why can't a why can't a frog be like frog supposed to swim? Why aren't you swimming? Well, I was never taught, boss. Can you teach me?" And dunks him again. <laughs> it was great. Be like, just it was such a delight to to listen to these voice actors as these these uh was it four or three? It was four. It's four guys. Four guys. Yeah. Four guys. It's four guys. And just. It was the delight. I was like, "Wow!" I I, I never expected myself to be uh, like enchanted by the 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 go the uh, the goons, the goon mm -hmm. characters. I just be like, they're very well done, very well. They're not rounded characters, but they're characters that are like, "Oh, okay, I'm invested where they're going in this story," and they just make it a delight watching it. So yeah, the goons. What is your second? My second like here is the cat. Mm. Uh, Dino, AKA Mr. Cat. Yes. Uh, or as I like to call him, Shadow the Hedge Cat. He is so like interesting. He, he obviously he's he doesn't have a voice. No. Because he's just a regular cat. I don't even think we hear a meow. Well, we do, we do hear a meow. We do hear him hiss. Okay. Yeah. A couple yeah. times, but it's like almost, it's there, but it's not there. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, I really thought the way they animated him was cool. Uh, it really felt like he was, well, obviously intelligent cat, mm -hmm. but it really felt like he was just as much, while he was still a cat, he was very much had his own plans going on to, to take care of both uh, Nico and Zoe, yeah. which I thought was, was, was cool. So yeah, yeah the ca character of the cat was... Uh, I, I enjoyed him. Okay. What's your third like? Third like. Uh, my third like would actually be more of the story because at first the story is kind of unique because you're you're dealing with more of the cat perspective of uh, Mr. Cat or mm -hmm. not Nico. Dino. But, yeah, Dino. Uh, and you get his perspective and you don't expect uh, young Zoe to follow him. And it's like, okay, that's interesting. So you get where he's talking with Nico and just like, it's a very unique story. So you, you think it's going somewhere and you don't expect it to go this direction. And so then you're, you're dealing with the mom situation. You're dealing with her trying to catch the, uh, the, the crime boss, which I find absolutely hysterical, mm -hmm. but overall the, the story itself with uh, Mr. Cat or Milo, sorry, Nico. Yeah. Nico, the cat. 
Oh, the cat is Dino. 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 You know, got it. Dino. Got like it. the Flintstones dinosaur. Yes, except the cat. Yeah, so yeah, you know, I, I I enjoy the dynamic of the story because you're 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 following all the characters and they all kind of just uh, merge into the the third act of this film where they're all kind of uh, everything's kind of colliding or what's the word I'm looking for? Um, they're synergizing onto you know one, colliding is a good word. Yeah, for colliding, it. collide. You know, the story's colliding into itself and. With a lot of story tell me you like you get you you're they're trying to wrap the third act up and they're kind of missing here and there it's kind of disjointed with this movie it's not because you're literally following all these different characters mm -hmm. around and they collide into each other they merge into that third act and the third act is great the third act is wonderful it is a just it is a wonderful piece of art i'm going to say this movie is art in, in so many ways, it's very well storyboarded and told and voice acted. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely in the, the, uh, the English dub, uh, them. Yes. The English dub, but yeah, it's just, it's a beautiful film story wise characters, everything. It's a great film. What's your third, my third, like for this, I, I like how it wraps up because mm. I mean, it very easily could be, Oh, thank you for saving my daughter. Now you're going to jail for all the crimes that you've committed. Exactly. It could have gone that way. That's what I kept thinking. I'm thinking this is not going to turn out good because mm -hmm. I mean, it's a Kobayashi Maru scenario, right? When you're dealing with, uh, for, for Nico, because yeah. he can either a save Zoe and probably get arrested, right? Or B escape and Zoe gets sold to the highest bidder basically yeah uh that's kind of where i was were afraid it might go at, at one point uh but, but so yeah he's in the kobayashi he's in that kobayashi maru that no win scenario and his character comes through where he goes and saves zoe even though it's probably going to result in him getting arrested and thankfully he doesn't uh so i I know that my description says he reformed, but I, there's a part of me that's thinking, no, it's just his new wife is just looking the other way. <laughs> yeah. He, 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 apparently he's found content. He's content, content in, at least. Content of course, we never life. understood why he was stealing in the first place. Cause it no. really didn't feel like he was no. stealing for money. Yeah. It really felt more like he was stealing for fun for lack of a better term. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that's my that's my third like is the fact that this actually ends well, even though because it could have ended badly for mm -hmm. everyone. Agreed. So yeah, but now we need to get into our dislikes. Yes. What's your first dislike? Um, there again, I don't have a whole lot of dislikes for this film. Uh, you did point something out that kind of made more sense. You have Nico, who we really don't understand why he does this. He just. Like it's maybe more of an assumption that oh he's just a cat burger that he he steals just for himself or I'd be like I, I would have loved to see more of like maybe he's oh he's trying to get money for his mother or something like that or his sister I would I would have even gone from a stealing from the rich to give to the poor yeah, more in a way Robin Hood. like maybe he was he was stealing all this high end art not because mm. he's an art fan yeah. but selling it and then giving all that money to charity. I can see that, but there's another, it's the, there's, there's no real explanation in the film. Be like, yeah, for the, for the mother and the daughter, we get explanation, but for Dino, am I right? Dino? Yeah. Yeah. Dino. D, yeah. Dino. We really don't get an explanation why he's a, he's a cat burglar. He's, he's a cat burglar for cat burglar's sake. And, Dino uh, is the cat. I'm Nico sorry. is Nico, the, the Sorry. Burglar. I'm getting these two characters mixed up for some reason. Yo, cat, cat burglar mm -hmm. there. Minus one's voice by Steve yeah. Bloom. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, just, we, we really don't get Nico's story. We just, well, oh, he's a cat burglar. And he, like, he does this for a living. And Mr. Cat shows up. And that's more of the plot device, what moves the, the story forward. But we just don't understand why. It's never explained to us at all. But... And like Drew said, it's more at the very end of like the, the settling down and becoming a family. And you have Nico, who's a cat burglar, who apparently has reformed his ways or is not telling or him. 
he has quote unquote reformed. Yeah, he's reformed. He's been reformed, or he's he's he only as far been, as his wife knows. Yeah, who who's a freaking detective? Actually, I'm still going with the wife knows, but the super the superintendent does not. Yeah, the superintendent doesn't know. Same person. Yes, I'm aware. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's about the only dislike I have to this film because we're not really given an explanation why he got burglars. Be like, it's not Selena Kyle who just is just greedy and just wants money and fame for herself. Be like, Nico's just stealing for some reason. He, we don't get it. And he hides all his stuff in his apartment. Wow. Smooth move, x -Lax. Yeah. Smooth criminal, right? Chump, chump, chump. What's your first dislike? My first dislike for this film... I do not understand the whole hallucination at the end. If it really feels like they needed a Deus Ex Machina to, to, to end this thing. Yeah. Cause it, it was starting to go kind of, kind of crazy. And all of a sudden he gets randomly hit by something. And all of a sudden he's hallucinating that the Colossus of Nairobi is mm -hmm. coming to him. And I'm like, huh? Exactly. That, that was, that is kind of a weird because I, I guess they they need to wrap the story up. Yeah, that's kind of so, what I figured. Because yeah. honestly, there was they had pretty much got to the end of the story at that yeah. point, and they needed to wrap it up. But they they were stuck in this action moment that they couldn't easily get out of. True. And instead of having uh, Victor Costa mm -hmm. uh, trip and fall to his death normally, they decided he's going to hallucinate that the, that this Colossus of Nairobi is coming to him. Okay. Well, that's I mean, the like thing. It's, that's a choice. Well, it's the 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 classes of Nairobi. Nairobi. Yeah, Nairobi. Uh, be like that's the thing he's been seeking the entire time, and so I guess when when he gets I, his, he that bumps I his get. head, he get bumps his head. It's more like he believes that the, the, his desire is coming towards him, so he leaps for it. But he was okay. But here's the thing: Victor Costa was a fairly well-adjusted person. Oh, I agree. Before it's, the hit. Mm-hmm. That hit that's causing them to hallucinate that the Colossus of Nairobi mm -hmm. is coming towards him is should not have gotten him stupid oh, I, enough to jump for it. Oh, I agree. I agree. It's it's a it's, it's, it's a it's, stupid explanation. It's like as soon as he gets hit, he turns stupid. Yeah. It's like oh my Colossus and dives off the the crane. It's right. Like, it's like uh no. It, Find a different reason. I'm fine with him falling off the truck, falling off the, the crane and hitting the truck. And, and that's how he gets took out. I'm fine with that. But what was with the whole hallucination? Th the explanation thing was just not the best choice, in Agreed. my opinion. Agree. So, yeah, that's my that's my first. It's like, what's your second? I don't have a second or third. Oh, OK. Yeah. So have it. How about if you have any? So. This comes down to uh, the general art style. It's just something I don't like about this art style. And oh. that's the fact that hmm. the perspective on the floors kind of make them look somewhat like walls. You know what I mean? Okay. Like it looks like they're walking up like a sharper incline than you know they're supposed to be. Right. And I, I have never liked that about this art style. Okay. Fair. Uh, Grant, this is a nitpick. So yeah. Fair. And, uh, the last nitpick there is one instance of non hand drawn animation in this film oh yeah Do tell. there is a point where somebody opens a door oh okay and i don't remember why it's near the beginning of the film because i think it's actually uh uh claudine opening the door to zoe's room i think okay and the camera is like zoomed in really close for some reason. Mm -hmm. And the way the door opens, that could have been hand drawn. Possibly. Except I have seen, you know, I'm, I'm thinking back to how all of the uh, caps animation stuff we've watched over the years. Yeah. Where they have thrown in like a 3D uh, drawn object that they then like somebody hand inked, mm -hmm. you know? So, and then, and then 
and did the art in the 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 coloring in in the caps mm -hmm. i'm thinking and, and where it's 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 2d don't get me wrong but it's a little just a little too clean okay fair enough a, almost a little almost it's artificial feeling and i know what you're saying drew it's a door <laughs> what does it matter that they took one little shortcut i'm just saying they mm -hmm. said it was hand drawn there's one moment where it's painfully obvious if you've seen this stuff before and you know what it is, mm -hmm. then it's not hand drawn exactly. and it kind of bugs me Fair, and it's a nitpick. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm allowed to be a little off there. So yeah, that's my third and final dislike. Totally fair. Uh, what are you rating this film? I'm rating this a solid nine. This All movie, right. This movie is great. Like again, art, it'd be like, this is a very art artsy film that be like relies more on its art than anything. It's, it's got a good story. It's got great characters. It's got a great plot. It, the plot around, is around, not really the cat, but the cat is the catalyst. Mm -hmm. See what it did there? Cat catalyst. 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 <laughs> to, you know, drive the story forward. And like, it's, it's good. It's got a good conclusion. I do agree with Drew that the, uh, to wrap the story up is to have our main villain get whacked on the head and immediately have a del have a delusion and jump off a high place to his apparent demise. Mm -hmm. But yeah, overall, I love this film. I, I wish I could get maybe at some point, maybe I can find it and actually own it uh, because physical media is key because we don't know how much longer we'll mm -hmm. have physical media. Uh, so yeah, I'm giving it a nine. What about you? I'm giving this an 8.5. Oh. It's good. Don't mm -hmm. get me wrong, mm -hmm. but eh, it's, it's, a, it, it's as, as good as it is. There's, there's just a couple little tweaks that okay. probably would have made it a little bit better. Uh, and some of it's just personal stuff. It's just. It's not quite a nine for me, so I'm just bumping it down to 8.5, there, basically. But uh, yeah, that brings us to the end of this review. Yes. Next week, oh, we have made a very fun. controversial decision. Yes, we and have. And the thing is, we technically made this decision in our first year. In fact, I think this was one of the original films we talked about doing yes, at some we point we during our pre-show days. And we're finally doing we're it. We're finally doing it. And we're doing it because... Those who do not study history are doomed to repeat exactly. it. Exactly. We're going to be reviewing Song of the South, the movie that Disney is so ashamed of that they haven't put it out on home video in the United States ever. Mm -hmm. Except for actually, I think there was a VHS copy there, once. There, there was a VHS a release. There was a VHS release back in the eighties. Yes, but there's been no home video releases since then. Yeah, there's there there were there in were, America. In America, there were home releases. Later there are DVD different... and DVD releases at, in like Europe and yeah, Britain. Europe. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was ever released on Blu-ray. No, it never was. Uh, Cause it, that became a worldwide ban at some point, mm -hmm. but yeah, this is probably a mistake on our part, but like we said, Who knows? this is something, this is an important for being the one film that Disney is so ashamed of. They won't even put it out there to make it easy to watch it makes us curious to even watch it, it makes us curious to watch it and we got to see what's so horrible about this film now that being said i do remember having a vhs with the brer rabbit cartoons that oh, are yeah. part of this mm -hmm. i know i i know i watched those and i could be wrong but i think i had a book of those brer rabbit stories back in the day Mm -hmm. I don't know if I still have it. Well, I don't have it here in this apartment, but I don't know if it's still around, but yeah, that's all I really know about the film. Other than there are live action segments that I've never seen. And from most of the reviewers I've heard actually review this film, mm -hmm. it's mostly about slow moving racial relations in the United States. Yeah. It's like, okay, we'll just see how to how this goes. Yeah. So join us next week for that. But in the meantime, we're going to be talking about what we've been watching, mm -hmm. the news, and kind of maybe sort of, I don't know, the end of emotional damage? Possibly. We're getting close. 
This podcast is a proud member of Culture Box. Whether you enjoy geeky reviews, comedy, or original fiction, you can open up the Culture Box and find something excellent for your soul. Point your web browser to culturebox.media. This week, we suggest checking out... I get there. Didn't have this up for some reason. Womp, womp, womp. Playing Games with Strangers. Playing Games with Strangers is a family-friendly, actual play podcast where indie voice actors get together and play tabletop role-playing games. You can listen to their adventures unfold as they roll dice, slay monsters, and have lots of fun. All at playinggamesofstrangers.com. The Cellcast would also like to thank the following patrons. Ashley and Francisco Ruiz, Book of Gaming, PaulJPowers.com, Edwin Gonzalez, and new this week... The Monster Island Film Vaults. So join us. Uh, if you want your name listed on the show, some special art from Jacob, uncut episodes, and access to uh, pre to uh, timed exclusive reviews upcoming of X-Men 97. Mm-hmm. Like I said, timed exclusive. This will come out later for patrons mm-hmm. at, a, at a later date. Mm-hmm. Uh, join, you can join at the $5 level, or if you want to force us to against our will against our will within reason within reason <laughs> review people. a film uh you can donate the ten dollar level to make patreon picks and you actually get a special uh channel in our discord to go talk in mm-hmm. so come join us for that so jacob i have a question for you i might have an answer what have you been watching what have I been watching? Ah. My notes were being funny. Uh, okay, yes. Uh, so what I've been watching, uh, I've been watching a little bit of NCIS on Netflix. Uh, yeah, I've always loved NCIS. So I'm just kind of going back through it on season two already. And uh, yeah, I, I feel like I've always loved NCIS because it's, you know, understanding what criminals do and... I think the last episode I did, it was a um, a Navy corpsman had gone missing and they were trying to find her. And apparently she had been kidnapped by a uh, chaplain and was forced to live under a basement as a 1950s wife or something like that. Like that was just really, it's like, okay, that's creepy. Just mm-hmm. a little bit. Uh, also kind of in, I wouldn't say um and retroactive kind of morning in a way i didn't know it at the time but i finished dragon ball z abridged the original run of it mm-hmm. before they do the bit the boo bits uh that is an interesting the very how they end that is very interesting because they knew they couldn't continue well they planned to that's the thing yeah they did they were on. actually planning on the releasing the next movie which was going to be Bojack and Bound, mm-hmm. and then they were going to go into season four with the the Boo Saga. Yes, and they decided they were done after they had already made these announcements. Yes. Hmm. So you're aware? Oh, okay. I thought it was something to do more like they were getting uh, cease and assist from Toei. They hadn't quite gotten that yet, but the copyright situations were getting worse. Oh, okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. So and it was one of those cut while we're ahead. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, so yeah, uh Team Four Star. Absolutely incredible, guys. They they can they can make the most amazing parody and make it so incredibly moving. And it's just it's great. It's just <laughs> the way they make Goku is absolutely hysterical. But uh overall, ama- amazing there and- may be in the future, maybe some coverage of this. We'll see. Yes. We will see. We shall see. And uh, I've been listening to ever since kind of like walking back forth from work and uh, with a car issue that I'm not going to go into here in the show. Uh, I probably am going to listen to a new a new, se- a, a new podcast I recently discovered. Uh, it's from the Super Carlin Brothers YouTube channel. They, d- they do everything Harry Potter. And uh, they are do- they're, they're going through the Harry Potter ser- book series through what... Um, the podcast called Through the Griffin Door. 
Uh, right now, I'm nice. I'm I'm halfway through uh, Philosopher's Stone, or uh, yeah, Philosopher's Stone, and it's good because these guys have a enormous encyclopedia of knowledge of the world of Harry Potter, and uh, it's it's really interesting here. These guys because they are very professional in how they do everything. And so it'd be like, if you want to listen to something like some people go through chapter by chapter of Harry Potter, I think they're right now, I think they're in the middle of, um, the chamber of secrets, I believe. So I'm, I'm halfway there. So, and what they calculate is probably about four years until they get to the very end of Deathly Hallows. So yeah, it looks like an interesting ride for the next four years. to listen through those books. So yeah, that's what I've been listening to. So what have you been watching, listening to, or most likely playing? Well, there has been some playing. Yes. Uh, of course, Persona 3. I have slowed down a bit on that because mm. this, my schedule has kind of changed up a little. Mm. Not a lot, but with with me getting a little behind on editing, I... I have not. I am not in a. I have not played as much Persona Three Reload as I would like Fair. to, and of course, as you all know, Saturday mornings mm -hmm. I am been. I am playing starting last week uh, mm -hmm. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Mm -hmm. So join us. Join me in the morning for that if you are watching live, or every Saturday morning for the foreseeable future, with exceptions because life happens. Yes. Uh, also. Last Saturday, after I got done with the uh, my the stream, I went into town and saw Dune Part Two. Yeah, how was that? It was a good film. Okay, I enjoyed it. Uh, it's as as someone I I did read the book beforehand. I read okay. the book before watching Dune Part One. Exactly, and it's been a hot minute since I read the book. And this technically is my third Dune film because I've also watched mm -hmm. the 1980s <laughs> version, which is a trip. In which we reviewed on Movie uh, of the Week podcast. Movie of the Week podcast we did. Actually, I know we reviewed it. I have no idea if that was an episode that actually got released. Let me check. But either way. Yes. Because uh, there's a couple of those we didn't get released for one reason or another. Yes. Um, and I don't have access to those files. Yes. But we wa I watched that. It was It was a very good film. Uh, and then let's see, of course I'm, I'm listening to, uh, I, well, I am listening to a book on tape. Okay. It is the seventh book. I believe it's book seven in the Fred, the vampire accountant series. Huh? Uh, it, the book is posthumous, uh, learning. No, no. Hang on. I will. This won't take long. I just got to get to get to my thing here. Posthumous education. Okay. What was that? Okay. Uh, so I'm 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 currently going through that. I'm about three quarters of the way through that book, and uh, that's a, if you've not read the Fred Fred the Vampire Accountant series, I actually suggest that it's kind of cozy hmm. in a weird sort of way, with vampires and dragons and such. Okay. Uh, in a, it, it's like the only urban fantasy I like. Okay. It's the nicest, best way I know how to put that. But right before Jacob came over. Yes. And you've already hinted at, uh, at this. Yes. Because of some sad news we got late last night. Mm -hmm. I felt the need to finally do what I've been debating doing for the past year or two. So a little boy looking after... Uh, shiny balls. I decided to restart watching Dragon Ball, starting with the original Dragon Ball anime. Mm. And I, I don't know if I'm going to go through the whole thing, <laughs> but rewatching these first couple episodes mm. tonight while I was getting ready, I was like, there's just something about this show that granted, yeah. The original Dragon Ball, I know why I originally was not that big a fan. Yeah. At this time, mostly because half of it was getting cut out by the censors. That is true. <laughs> but watching the uncut version, which you can kind of tell when you move into the censored version when you move back out, because mm -hmm. they only recorded one English dub. <laughs> well, they record they recorded all the censored version first. 
Then they went back and cut in all the lines mm -hmm. that was uncut. So in one scene, it's about sandwiches. And in another scene, they're talking about uh, something else. <laughs> Let's just say that. Uh, and oh so that's kind of a little awkward in that, but I'm enjoying going back through that. And I think I may, I'm going to try to go through the whole thing and I'm debating whether or not. Okay. So I'm enjoying doing the kingdom hearts untangling, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I'm like, I don't know if I want to continue. Okay. And so I'm thinking of maybe switching gears to doing something else, maybe Dragon Ball related under the current circumstances, but we'll see. Okay. I don't know. But uh, we'll come back to that at a later point. Okay. So, uh, so I, I want to make a real quick point because we mentioned Dune because we did do a review on a movie of the week podcast, which uh -huh. we did for, like for about a year, year and a half. Yeah. With my brother, Jim. And uh, it actually was released. So if you want to hear our thoughts on the original Dune from 1984, uh, go find Movie of the Week podcast and wherever you listen to podcasts and go listen to that. And um, yeah, just go check out what we thought of that movie. I still need to see, I still need to see part two. It was good. So that's going to be it for what we've been watching. Jacob, hit us with some news, even yes. though we know some of it's sad. Yes. The Cellcast News with your host, Jacob Heron. Why, thank you, Dlit. And going into news, uh, yes, obviously we have to start off with the, the big news that came out last night. And it's sad to hear, but... Uh, Akira Toriyama, the acclaimed manga artist behind the global phenomenon Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z, and all the Dragon Ball series. Um, Along with Chrono Trigger and... Uh, Dr. Sludge? Slump? Dr. Slump. Slump. And then he was also the major art director for the Dragon Quest series of video games. Yes. Uh, so uh, he, is, uh, he died last night at the age of 68, according to the official Dragon Ball website. The artist died from an acute subternate. Did you say he died March 1st? Uh, no. Because that's when the, the thing I said read said he actually died March 1st, and they oh. just now are announcing it. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Uh, that's kind of a Japanese thing because they want the, the family to fair, be, have a grieving fair. time before they do a public announcement. That, that is understandable. So he, apparently he died March 1st. Yeah. From an acute hematoma. Acute hematoma, which is a blood clot on the brain that usually forms after an accident on March 1st that his funeral has already been held by close relatives. So yes, we lost a legendary icon of artist mm -hmm. and manga creator in Akira Toriyama and uh, he will be missed, but his legacy will continue through Dragon Ball, Chrono Trigger and all the other supplemental creations the man ever did. And um, for, for an artist who is on Twitter, uh, Twitter slash X, whatever you want to call it. Key. key. Okay. Key. <laughs> so, uh, the the amount of artists that I you know I follow on there, there's so much uh, love and adoration for the late mm -hmm. Toriyama. It's not even funny, just amazing art. People just how much uh, they appreciated his art, what inspired them. Uh, I think Toriyama inspired me with the uh, with Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z primarily, because I remember either after school, tsunami, or during football practice, someone would bring in a VHS of the the most recent episode when we watched that and i think it was during the cell saga cell saga or, or uh frieza saga or whatever and that was just amazing so yeah toriyama toriyami toriyami i'm gonna say toriyama it, toriyama uh will be truly missed but his his legacy and his um creation will live on so uh he shall be truly missed so on a little more brighter note uh, let's talk about some Shrek 2. That Our, movie's already out. Yes, I know, but apparently Universal and DreamWorks Animation announced that the a U.S. theatrical re-release of the Academy, Academy Award nominee Shrek 2 uh, in celebration of the film's 20th anniversary 
uh yeah apparently will be released uh nationwide on april 12th so if you loved shrek 2 which i love shrek 2 i thought it was gr a great movie it's it's it surpasses its predecessor as mm -hmm. a film and shrek plus, 2 is actually the better film yeah in my agreed opinion. agreed and you get puss and boots puss and a boots <laughs> Played by Antonio, Antonio Banderas, Banderas, still playing Zorro, but in cat form. <laughs> cat form, of course. So, yeah. Like I said on Retro Rewind Podcast's review of The Mask of Zorro, there is a reason why DreamWorks just took the character from that movie and mm -hmm. stuck it in Shrek 2. Yes. And turned and it into a cat. <laughs> Fear me if you dare. I, I love that film. I, I'm, I know some, we've done Shrek. I know that. We haven't done two yet. We've not done Shrek two yet. Yeah, we're gonna do two at some point. Which we're gonna be like, yay! Then three, <sighs> three was terrible. I am. Yeah. Here's the thing. I am not putting the Shrek movies on the list. I'm leaving that to you. Okay. So when you're ready for it, okay, we'll do that. Okay. We'll go. Yay! Shrek two. Shrek three is. Just... Uh, and then Shrek four. After DreamWorks decided in marketing that they're gonna change the name of all their movies to something shorter that's for them to say. Mm-hmm. Just and randomly Shrek 4 wasn't names. bad. Because Shrek 4 is technically named Shrek Forever After. Yeah. But when you but the guy in the commercial list said Shrek 4, the final chapter. Yes. Yeah, like, that's else. not the name of the film. No, it's not. <laughs> it's right there. <laughs> but either but either or. So if you are a fan of Shrek 2, it's gonna be in theaters on April 12th. So go get your tickets now. It's probably on Fat, probably on you know Fandango or what have you. Wherever you buy tickets. Wherever you buy tickets, go buy them. Go enjoy this film in theaters. I think I would enjoy go watching it myself. But um, uh, there again, um, huge shout out to a listener, to our, a listener and a fan of ours, Heather uh, Heather Morgan for uh, like all week. She literally would just be shooting me messages about. You know, new trailer drop, new trailer drop, this information, this information about this. And this is, again, thank you so much, Heather, for your due diligence about, you know, looking up information about upcoming events, and upcoming this and this and this. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts for uh, doing that due diligence and sending it to me for I can say it to our fans here on the show. So thank you again. She is definitely our uh, first run reporter. Yeah, you're not to, kidding. So that you can actually get the set on the show. Yes. So thank you again, Heather. Yeah. So uh, Disney and Pixar announced on May 7th, which was yesterday, uh, unveiled the newest trailer plus new images for Inside, Inside Out 2, which welcomes new emotions into the new into now now teenagers riley's mind if you don't remember who riley is riley is the the uh the young shot the young girl which the emotions are from so if you need a quick refresher I, we've already done an episode over inside out mm -hmm. so go find that in your favorite podcast feed or directory and go listen to it and uh, let us know what you thought of our review of inside out too uh going on a little bit more uh this is regarding kung fu panda 4 with uh, Jack Black ready to make his triumph return as the black and white hero of a panda to Kung Fu Panda 4 this Friday, or actually the day on March, uh, March 8th, the, the night of this recording. Uh, so if you are a fan, you are probably in theaters right now watching Shrek or Shrek 4. No, we're talking about Kung Fu Panda 4. Skidoosh. Skidoosh. We need yes. to do some more of those, too. Yes, we do. Well, I think I got Kung Fu Panda 2 on later this year. Probably. Uh, critics have weighed in on the Skidoosh worthiness of Poe's latest adventure. Fans of the Shrek, uh, the DreamWorks franchise, and those carting the next generation of younger moviers to cinemas will be glad to know that the reviews of our promising a solid live action family uh, action packed family adventure that follows Poe of the Kung Fu Panda franchise. The fourth installment of this has earned a 77 on right on fresh on Rotten Tomatoes um, from 38 critics reviewed so far with a more mixed rating of 54 with Metacritic 20 cr uh, critics reviewed. Uh, in comparison, Kung Fu Panda 3 in 2003, 2016 holds a 80, 
87% critical rating and a 79 audience score Kung Fu Panda tour Kung Fu, Kung Fu Panda 2 in 2011 has a mix a fairly close ratio of 81 71 uh, 74 and the original Kung Fu Panda 2008 is still kicking it with a 87 87 83 uh, comparison the three previous film three three previous films have taught have, uh, taught up uh, 1.8 million dollars in the global box office so again last bit of news for tonight thank you again Heather well, before she- you before you do that okay uh, I want I want to say uh, mention I, I just saw the greatest headline for Kung Fu Panda 4 okay this is from not the B okay. that website Okay. And it says, I watched Jack Black sing Hit Me Baby One More Time to promote his new movie, and now there's coffee all over my computer screen. <laughs> oh, that is perfect. That is perfect. <laughs> all right. So, so anyway, last bit of news. Last bit of news. Uh, this is regarding the second season of Monsters at Work on Disney+. Plus. Uh, the Emmy-winning... Animated series Monsters at Work, which is inspired by Monsters Incorporated and Monsters University, uh, is getting a second season. Um, it's returning for a second season with a two-episode premiere starting on Friday, April 5th, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Disney Channel and Disney XD. Sub- subsequently, air it will be moved to Saturdays with two more episodes launching each week beginning at 10 a.m., Eastern Standard Time on both channels leading up to the series streaming debut on Disney Plus starting on uh, May 5th, which is a Sunday. And uh, again, thank you so much for, to uh, Heather Morgan for her due diligence and sending information our way for news and st- for the news. Thank you. And that's all I have for the news. Really? What did I miss? I'm surprised, actually, that you have forgotten this. And you oh. didn't put it in your notes. Okay. What the You're heck? the one who posted it to the Facebook page. Hmm. About a certain movie that is going to be back in theaters the week we're reviewing it. Oh, that's right. The end of Evangelion. Which is not playing anywhere around no, here. No, it's not. <laughs> it's just like, we got so close yes. to actually being able to review a film mm. while it's in theater. Yes. Technically. Yes. <laughs> so if, if you are... Uh, I don't, I don't know if you want to say blessed or cursed. I honestly don't know because yeah, this movie is so mucked up. I'm guessing it is. Okay. So here's the thing. Yeah. If I had a choice if you had between a choice. watching the end of Evangelion mm-hmm. on my television screen or watching it in a movie theater. Yes. And by, if I had the choice, I mean, Tyler. If it's playing in mm-hmm. Tyler, at yes. the, that's the farthest distance I want to go. Yeah. <laughs> I would do it. Okay, fair enough. I would see it in a theater because, in my opinion, if you're going to watch a film and you have the chance to see it in a theater, yes. see it in a theater, it will be a better, pre- it, you'll have a better experience. Okay. 99.99% of the time. Fair. Unless you're in a place with a bunch of jerks, but I can't help that. Fair. So yes, if, but more than likely I'll be watching it on Netflix. And that's the other thing is mm-hmm. that is probably the Netflix dub that they're showing. Yes. Which is different than the dub you'll be watching for that film. Mm-hmm. I assume. Yes. I'll still be watching the original, the original dub from ADV. Right. So, uh, this, uh, this will be a Japanese only. It'll be a Japanese, uh, Japanese language. Oh, so, so it's sub only. Okay. It's sub, I didn't realize it's sub that. Only. Yeah, it's only sub. So if it is in your neighborhood and you are a fan of Evangelion or you're just more oddly fascinated with this film, uh, go at it. And if you have a chance, uh, let us know what you thought of watching this film that has never been showed here in America in theaters. Uh, please let us know what you thought and uh, let us know. And because, um, again, we'll be reviewing this film in... Two weeks, two weeks, yeah, two weeks, literally so, not at right. At, we'll have next week being song, song of, of the, the South, South and following that end of Evangelion. Evangelion. Yeah. And the thing is, I placed song of the South before I realized that 
mm-hmm. I was placing it at the very end of our Evangelion run. Yes. And that we were going to be doing end at, that the movie end, the end of Evangelion after that as a movie review. Mm-hmm. But either way. Yeah, so that movie is going to be in theaters right around the time we're going to do, be doing the review for our review for the end of Evangelion. So again, if you are capable of watching, there again, be like, if you haven't watched the series and you have no desire to go and you don't want to get creeped out about everything, do not go watch this film. Or if you're more interested, you'll be like, you have watched the series and you've seen the movie and you know what's going to happen, go watch it. Let us know what you think about all of the orange juice is going to be spilled, as Drew has been saying quite often. Oh, that's a lot of orange juice. That's lie me to the moon. That's a lot of orange juice. Uh, anyways, so that is all I have for in the news. In that case, it's time to get to the orange juice <laughs> and uh, talk about the last two real episodes of Even Kelly. Yes. <laughs> or really the last two episodes before the split. <laughs> yes. As of course Stephen He doing saying emotional damage and the Lost Four Kids dub of Evangelion uh, met by Eagle Eight Burger. All the other audio is copyright. Who owns it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> First episode of the night: Tears, aka Ray Three. Which I just realized what's interesting about that title. Yes. Because we had Ray 1 and 2 earlier in the season. In my mind, it's like, okay, it's the third Ray episode. The yeah. Ray's focus episode. But then I realized, by the end of this, <laughs> Ray 3. Yeah, it's Ray 3. <laughs> Directed by Masahiko Otsuka and Ken Ando. And written by Hideaki Anno and Hiroshi Yamaguchi. Mm-hmm. When an angel resembling a coil of light arrives... I thought it looked more like DNA. Ray Mm. and Shinji are sent to battle it, but the assimilating ability of the foe prompts Ray to self-destruct Evangelia Unit Zero in order to kill it and save Shinji. Mysteries abound as a clone of Ray later appears in the hospital, and Ritsuko reveals the terrible secret of the dummy plug system Mm -hmm. to Masato and Shinji. Trivia for this episode. The angel that appears in this episode is Armizial, uh, there are the on the differences between the on air version and the director's cut. The battle with Armizial is much shorter. The Tower of Angels, the battle with Ava 01 and the scene of Ava Unit sorry Ava Unit One and the scene of Ava Unit Zero transforming mm. into a giant glowing ray are all absent in mm. the uh, in the on air version. Ray's animation is much more cartoonish and less detailed. In the uh, on-air version, her expressions may be considered more vacant and neutral. She's a doll after all. Ritsuko's expression can also be considered more neutral, and the expressions and the subtle animations that hint at her emotional state after her release are missing. Mm -hmm. There are far fewer rejected Avas in the Ava graveyard, and the Ray tank is much smaller. Mm -hmm. The version of Fly Me to the Moon in this is called Ray number 23, it being the 23rd episode, Mm -hmm. and it is 90 seconds long. Yes. And if I remember correctly, when we talked about this last night, you Mm -hmm. couldn't remember which episode this was because the next episode fills you with so much rage. But we'll get to that in a minute. We'll get there. What are your thoughts on this episode? This episode is very unique because you have, it's like, okay, we get this different angel. We get Ray trying to, you know, 
uh, trying to understand herself better. She's like, you know, more conflicted with things. And uh, obviously we get into the, get into the battle itself with the angel and it, it attacks unit one, AKA attacking Ray. Asuka, who is literally can't sink with her Ava whatsoever because she is so down in the pit. Mm -hmm. And uh, she literally can't do anything because she is so depressed and her, her, to her, her value is she no longer has value. And which, to point, you do have value for a person who yes. struggles with those thoughts. You do have value. So just a good, friendly reminder, you have value. Um, so you have uh, Oscar really can't do anything. She's a sitting duck out there. They have to pull her back. Uh, Shinji is kind of, he's being Shinji like usual, like from mm -hmm. most of the season. Except for those two episodes, just like I'm the coolest guy ever. Oh my gosh! Yeah, he <laughs> he, he kind of gets humbled a little bit, but um, yeah, this episode's very unique because there again we get a lot of more like philosophizing and more mm -hmm. introspective of Ray because we normally don't get that from Ray, and uh, I like it especially when she sacrificed herself in order to save Shinji because she she has to her she's understanding she has a a very deep connection with Shinji. I wonder why. Yeah. Yeah. You wonder why. And then you get the, uh, you get the AV unit one explosion and everything's and AV unit zero's explosion. A zero, you know, zero's explosion and all the hush hush and be like, Oh, we found, we found the, uh, the, not the tube, the, uh, what do you call the it? dummy plug dump the, 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 plug. the plug, the plug surprise. It's not a plug. Yeah. It, it's not, it's, it's not a dumb. It, it's not a piece of computer. It is actually a live version of Ray in yeah. every single one. Yeah. It's weird. Right? So, and then we get Sele's, um, mm, Sele seal, whatever. Arp, arp. <laughs> They're not, this is not the episode they go nuts in. Oh, I thought it was. No, it's the next one with your favorite dude. Oh, yeah. They're, they're not consuming rage. They're not <laughs> in a good mood in this one. No, no. But they, they go crazy in the next one, which no. I just, anyway, we'll get there when we get well, there. Well, what, what I'm trying to say is be like, uh, they, oh, we can't, we can't, we can't trust uh, Gendo. We need to put the, our trust in someone else more. So they get um, Ritsko. They, they talk, am I, am I getting the two episodes? They're trying to get Ray, but Ray won't go, but they don't want Ray to go because, because Ray is recovering. So mm. Ritsko goes and stands in front of them buck naked. Yes. It's like, wow. Gendo never had to be naked. Oh my Sele, God. Sele, you perverts. Yeah. Just a little bit, but uh, a little bit. I won't say a lot, but it's in the episode because Ritsko be like shows, uh, uh, Masato and, and uh, Shinji, the what what the dummy system is and what all the extra rays are and how everything's really work. The uh, the Ava graveyard, which is like, it's like she says one Ava, but there's like multiple skeletons all over the place. Yeah. So yeah, obviously there was more that was prior there, to there, Unit Zero was not the first prototype. No. no. But it's like wow, this is a really dark episode and. Good night, everyone's murderers. Yeah, and well, and, all except for Shinji. All except for Shinji, and now, for now, sh for now, Shinji's kind of alone at this we, point. We'll get there. We'll get there. And then, like all of a sudden, we get uh, Asuka's useless now. Yeah, we, Ray we, might know herself. As, <laughs> might might as well be dead still. Somewhat, somewhat. So here, here's the point with that. It's like we we get the third Ray. We get the third Ray. And uh, she goes back to her apartment and she's like having this existential crisis and be like, okay, be like, I haven't been here, but I know I've been here. Be like, mm -hmm. I know these glasses. I know this smell. And she's literally trying, wants to break these glasses, but she's kind of resistant not to. And so it's very interesting. So this be like, it's Ray, but it's not Ray. So yeah. this is the third version of Ray, which they've created over and over again. Gendo, you sick puppy. We're getting there. We're getting there. So that is all I have for episode 23. This episode is not really that bad. It's, no, it's not. It's I would really say good. it's the last. Hurrah. It's 
the, the next episode is really the last one where it's like what I would call the last regular episode. Yeah, I agree. This episode is just very interesting. It's it's finally giving us a couple answers mm -hmm. about who Ray is, which I kind of figured out some of this, especially yes. with her in her dummy plug tube every once in a while mm -hmm. underneath a giant mechanical brain. Yes. Well, I say it's a mechanical brain. It may not be a mechanical brain. It looks like one. We finally actually, no, it's, it's that, that's in the next episode, sorry. Yes. Uh, I, I, these do kind of blend together. They do. Uh, but this is basically the end of Ray's story. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Pretty much. I mean, we have another Ray at the, in, at, at the end of this episode, mm -hmm. but the next three episodes of the series, at least of the TV series, not necessarily the movie, she doesn't do anything. No, it's primarily what we'll focus on from this point on is Shinji. Yeah, it's Shinji from this point. Mm -hmm. But uh, Ray in this episode, this is based definitely, uh, it's, we finally get explanations about her, the way she acts, why she's so robotic. Mm -hmm. And I, I liked it. Yeah. Strangely enough. It's a good episode. It's a you good, it's a good episode. It, we finally get some answers mm -hmm. and then we get kind to of. the next episode. Yeah. Let's dive into it, shall we? I want you to let me know when you want your rant master. Okay, I shall. The last cometh, aka the beginning and the end, or knock, knock, knocking on knock heaven's door. door. Directed by Masayuki and written by Hideaki Anno and Akio Satsukawa. In this episode, and I really do like the way this summary is, a despondent Shinji encounters a kind-hearted boy named Kaoru who quickly becomes his close friend. And that's the entire thing. Yeah, you're not kidding. We actually have a new cast member in this, as we mentioned a second ago, Kaoru Ke mm -hmm. Ke Nagisa. Kaoru? Kaoru Nagisa? Yeah. Well, it's it's Kaoru in the... It's, uh, it's Kaoru in both, but okay. I, I'm reading it and it's like, Kairu. The way I tend to read Japanese generally, mm, this fair. looks like it should be Kaworu. Okay. Gotcha. But Kaworu is good, close enough. Yeah. Uh, he was voiced by Akira Ishida in the mm -hmm. Japanese version, Kyle Studevant in the ADV original dub, Greg mm -hmm. Ayers in the director's ADV director's cut dub, mm -hmm. and Clifford Chapin in the Netflix dub. Mm. Trivia for this one, we get two angel appearances technically. Tabris which is the angel name for Kaoru. Mm -hmm. And Adam is finally revealed mm -hmm. to be Lilith. Yes. Which we did, like... Which I have known for, like, ten episodes yeah, now. Yeah, what? <laughs> and the way they do the reveal, it's like... I, I may, This may be different in the ADV dub, mm -hmm. but in the Netflix dub, it's like... Ad, Kaoru says, when, when he finally gets into mm -hmm. the chamber, he goes, yeah. Adam, Since we're no, about. Lilith. I'm uh -huh. going... That's how you're going to reveal who that is? <sighs> Which we already knew this was Lilith. We've known it for a while now. Yeah. Come on, Kairu, do better. And then, uh, it's like, and, okay, getting into the uh, mm -hmm. differences yes. between mm -hmm. the uh, on air version yes. and the video. The di video. Yeah. Uh, in the on air version, Asuka's shocked expression after slapping Shinji at the news of Kaji's death. Mm hmm along with the spilled coffee pot that we that apparently is seen in the end of Evangelion, mm -hmm. is absent. Yes. The brief appearance of the embryo of Adam is absent. Oh, that's right. The expanded conversation of Kaoru saying Ray is the same as him mm -hmm. is absent. Mm -hmm. The 15 Sele monoliths at the lake scene and Masato spying on Kaoru mm -hmm. is absent. Yes. Ray's face as she looks at Kaoru in Terminal Dogma is drawn mm -hmm. differently in the on-air version. Yes. Although differently drawn faces are something all of the Director's Cut episodes have. Lilith's legs have been added due to her growing back her legs in the Director's Cut version of episode 22. Mm -hmm. The next episode preview after the end of episode 24 is a preview for the video release version of End of Evangelion's first episode, episode 25, which consists of animatics of Asuka battling the MP Ava series, as well as Masato saying goodbye to Shinji. Yes. The video version of 26's next episode preview is shown after 
Air's video version. The This consists of the live action footage of Studio Gainax. Mm -hmm. The video version of The End of Evangelion was released on Laserdisc and VHS, along with episodes 25 and 26 of the series, as Genesis 13. Hmm. There is a rather popular theory that Asuka attempted to commit suicide by uh, slashing, slashing her wrists at the beginning of this episode, but there is not sufficient evidence to prove this. Makes sense. She instead was starving herself and simply waiting to die, mm. having lost the will to live, but did not want to die either. Mm -hmm. The episode's title is a straight reference to Bob Dylan's 1973 mm. song, Knocking on Heaven's Door, in which a dying lawman, aware that he is soon to pass away, addresses his wife as Mama and asks her to remove his now useless badge and guns. The beginning and the end can refer to both the process of birth and death, as well as refer to Kaoru, who is the final angel, but possesses the soul of Adam, the first angel and the progenitor. Mm -hmm. Akio Satsukawa was responsible for writing this episode alongside Hideaki Anno. Two early drafts of this episode, both credited to him, were released in September 1996 issue of the magazine June Supplement. These have numerous plot and characterization differences with the final episode, such as making the romantic subtext between Shinji and Kaoru completely explicit mm -hmm. and suggesting that Kaoru has attempted suicide in the past. Okay. In fly, the fly me to the moon for this one is normal mm -hmm. with an has an instrumental and is 90 seconds. Yes. Jacob. All right. The floor so, is yours. All right. The floor is mine. Thank you. So animation wise, oh my gosh, they like they, they did episode 23 done very well. This episode, I don't know what they did. Like the animation is golden throughout this entire thing. This is where they threw all the money for the next two episodes. Apparently, apparently, <laughs> or they or or for the director's cut, they went back and redid a lot of it. I don't know which I way. Had to, you saw how much I just read that they changed. Yes, agreed. They changed a lot of it. It's like, well, okay, so I'm getting the feeling that uh, the on air version, they must not have been able to f actually finish the episodes before they had to be mm -hmm. released to air. So they got them to a finished state mm -hmm. enough yes. that they could put it on television. That's the version ADV originally released uh, yes. over here. Mm -hmm. And then they went back and finished the episodes later. This is a thing that happens in modern anime all the time. It does. Yeah, it's animation wise. It's so good. Definitely with the opening where uh, Asuka is lying in this, you know, tub and her face is gone the whole bit. And she's, you know, have again, has lost the will to live and doesn't really want to die, but doesn't want to live either. And there again, you got value. So just reminder of that. Quick question. Hmm. Where was she when she was in that bathtub? I think she, I think it was probably in, um, cause if that was her and Shinji and Masato's apartment, did the apartment finally get destroyed? No, I, I think it was, uh, uh, Kaji's apartment. Okay. That makes more sense. That, that kind of makes I sense. Was just, she, she had this fascination. She loved Kaji. Right. That does make sense. I just, I saw that beginning and went like, it was like, where is she right now? Yeah. Yeah, the, the the beginning of this show, the beginning of this episode is beautiful. I mean, like it's dark and oh my gosh, just like so. Uh, <laughs> Hideaku, um, just like his style of mm -hmm. hmm, creepy, and then the ending of this episode I love because you get this nice little pop <laughs> of we'll someone's there. head. We'll get there. Yeah, we'll get there. We'll get there. But uh, overall, be like, I, I enjoyed the story because there again, be like, you might want to hit that. Let me know when. Yeah, now. Rantmaster activated. This audio clip owned by Nate Marchand of the Monster Island Film Vault. For more information, please go to monsterislandfilmvault.com. Good one. <laughs> oh my gosh. Let, let's, let, let's, let's leave a tell here, all right? So I remember watching this movie, the show, you know, a couple of years ago when I bought the, the big silver uh box set box set of this episode and i get to episode 24 i'm like what the heck's happening and now Grant, that's putting it mildly that's putting it mildly <laughs> and 25 and 26 are worse but <laughs> yeah yeah true i i think it's more of an artistic expression but that's we'll get there ones. we'll get there but karu oh i hate this character beyond belief <laughs> so okay let me paint you a scene with this one so you get all of a sudden you get this character 
named Karu to show up and be like, what is he sitting on? He's sitting on an angel statue after the events of the last episode. And I'm like, okay, subtle, subtle, like, oh my gosh, so freaking subtle who this freaking character is. And Especially then, since his first mm, lines in this is, yeah. Don't you just like music? I think it's the greatest thing the Lilans ever created. Yeah, exactly. Going, Lilans, huh? Yeah, Lilans, really? Subtle. Yeah, really? Oh, yeah, you're, you're definitely, oh, yeah, your sync ratio is totally fine with everything. It's like, oh, yeah, sure, sure, you're just another he's pilot. perfect. Yeah, he's perfect. I'm like my Aunt Petunia. <laughs> mm, Harry Potter reference people, love it. Anyways, we like this son of a mm, Bichon Frise. Mmm. Like, okay, I, I think Karu would be like literally is be like he is literally something that Sele mixed up, did something with to create Karu. And then it's like, oh, let's just torture Shinji even more. Put put this poor kid through more and more crap. There again, I'm trying to censor myself beyond belief because this enrages me beyond belief. It's like you you have Shinji who has gone through hell and back. And like he's starting, he's gone through all this crap. Everybody in his life is missing. And then all of a sudden, this son of a Bijan Frise shows up and manipulates and twists his, little, his emotions so much and be like puts him in situations and won't allow him to speak and put words into his mouth the entire freaking time. Oh my gosh, I hate characters like this. And so we like we we go on and on and on. It's just like, oh, cause Kairu loves Shinji. Bull snikes, he does. He's literally trying to use him in order to cause a third impact. Oh, I hate this character. Oh, brother. So, so as I'm saying this, oh my gosh, I'd be like, I I I am so emotionally charged with this one because I don't like manipulators. I do not like characters manipulate others for their own freaking their own their own gain. And this is what Kairu is. Kairu says all these wonderful things to make Shinji make make him have his own be like he is he is uh, he's loved by be like no one loves him blah 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 be like which we know is the biggest farce on the planet because we know Masato has been a mother to this man to this boy and trying to comfort him because he doesn't know how to be like he's so shocked so in shock of what happened with Ray, what's gone on with Asuka. He feels like he's alone now. And then you have this son of a Bijan Frise show up. And then it's just this vile betrayal of a friendship and a kindredship that has literally been built up out of what Sele is trying to do. And then you get this, Kairu is going to go to Central Dogma and quote unquote, you know, reconnect with Adam, which we lay, which we, as obviously most of us know, that is actually Lilith. And no kid. No kidding. It's like, wait a minute, you didn't know this and you're a freaking angel? Oh, by the way, he's an angel, which is surprise, surprise to nobody. <laughs> and it's like, oh, because he takes unit two and then unit one, pilot by Shinji, has to fight Ava unit two along with Kairu. And it's just the, oh my gosh. I hate this character so much. And it's just like, oh, be like, if one of us, blah, 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 blah. It's okay, pop his freaking head already. <laughs> and I loved it. I loved it when this freaking character's head got popped. I was so thrilled. I was like, yes. And then, it, then like at the very end of the episode, you have Shinji, who has been manipulated by the son of a Bichon Frise the entire time. Be like, oh, I wish Kairu would have lived. I wish Kairu would have lived. Like, oh, grow up and get a pair of balls, dude. Come on. Be like, you realize you have been manipulated the entire time. Be like, by Sele, by this angel, whatever kind of Bichon Frise he is. Urgh. Be like, for crying out loud, be like, you have a woman who deeply cares about you and you're just shutting down because you don't know how to react. And then it's like, oh, this guy shows up next. He wants to care about me. Arr. Yes, I, this episode made me so mad because there again, epi beginning episode, great, wonderful, episode, wonderful ending, wonderful beginning. Animation wise, Karu shows up. 
then my my rage kicks in about who this character is motivations the whole enchilada i get why i get why they brought this character in i get why and you, you for me this is how i see the character so that that is my little take on episode 24 of evangelion knock 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 on heaven's door question the, the ending is very good do not get me wrong yes question question what is your question if he was trying to cause the third impact why did he decide that the humans are the ones that were going to live i have no idea because he did from what i could tell yeah could be wrong if the third impact has occurred in this series because i already watched the next two episodes yeah, because i literally got to the end of this episode and said forget it i'm gonna finish it i've got two more episodes yeah, and i've got it. time <laughs> yeah and I watched the next two episodes, and I'm going to be honest, those two episodes, I couldn't tell if the third impact had happened or not. Yeah, that's true. I couldn't tell if the human instrumentality project had happened or not. Yes. So, from what I can tell, he stopped before the third impact could occur. Possibly. In this show. Yes. In the show. I'm not talking about the movie. Mm -hmm. In fact, we said earlier, this is where the split is. He yes. stopped before causing the third impact yes which tells me if the third impact is happening in the movie like i think it is something else is going to cause it yes. i'm blaming ray mm. <laughs> but because like, i've seen clips and i kind of have a feeling yeah so but i also have a feeling it's like ah, those are hallucinations yes but what i what i understand what Sele's intention was to Sele wanted the third impact. they say like wanted the third impact that's why they but sent the, Kauru. but my question is did Kauru actually cause the third impact because it doesn't look like it no it, it doesn't look like it but it looks like the third impact did not happen it didn't it didn't happen but, but like that was the which is the start of why i'm gonna sit here and go i know why people didn't like the ending of this show <laughs> because they wanted the third end well they, correction they, correction they, the third impact yes has been built up over the course of the past 24 24 this is episode 24, 24. the last 24 episodes yes it does not happen in this episode no. leaving two episodes remaining yes which have, in the series in this right in this you either go to the series which i have already watched or the mm. movie which i've not watched yet yes in the series, I'm not going to go into it because we're talking about that next week. Mm -hmm. But I can understand why people consider that disappointing. And it's not very clear mm -hmm. as to the events of the story. It really yes. does feel like this at the end of this episode, the story mostly ends. And then going forward, it's mm -hmm. just a psychological profile oh, told yeah. in a very artistic way. Yes. Agreed. We'll get to that next week. Yes. But from what i could tell just watching this episode mm -hmm. if it was supposed to happen in this episode it yeah. didn't yeah and it really felt like it was going to and in any other show if it weren't two more episodes mm -hmm. actually this would be a good ending it would be because we stopped the third impact before it occurred if she, if hideaki Yano had stopped here mm -hmm. Which it almost feels like, especially with the amount of money put into this. Yeah. Like, this is the last episode. Yeah. This is intended to be the last episode. Mm -hmm. And the fact that there's two more episodes, whether you go TV or movie, mm -hmm. is, almost, is almost like he realized he had two more episodes he had to make for the show. Yeah. Even though he had already ended the story. So he came up with an epilogue, kind of. Yeah. But like I said, we'll get to that. Yeah, we'll get to that. We'll, we'll get Both that. movie wise and TV show wise. Yes. It really does feel like this should be the last episode. So I honestly, as much as the the, the thing that confuses me more, because I'm like you, I hate Kauru and what mm. he does throughout mm. this episode. Yeah. Because it starts off acting like he is going to be, at the very least, from what I took, because I watched the Netflix stuff, mm. I did not see the versions of their relationship that occur apparently in the Japanese and in the ADV. Mm -hmm. But in the Netflix dub, it is less apparent that there is any sort of romantic relationship yes. other than friendship. Yeah. Because friendship is a thing. Mm -hmm. For instance, my good buddy here, mm -hmm. we're friends. Yes. I love him as a brother. Yes. I am not in love with him. And it's not <laughs> just because Ashley would kill me. 
<laughs> it is because neither one of us are that way. Yes, exactly. Because we're just friends. We are mm -hmm. close in that relationship. You can be two guys, two male people mm -hmm. can be that way without it being sexual. Yes. People. Exactly. Culture. <laughs> you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> And that's how it feels up until the point. Mm -hmm. Hang on. Rentmaster activated. This audio clip owned by Nate Marchand of the Monster Island Film Vault. For more information, please go to monsterislandfilmvault.com. I can tell I'm going here. <laughs> go for it. Because this... Fly me to the moon with this person. I'm trying not to say words. I know why you went to another language. Yes. <laughs> I don't even know what you said in that language, but I understand the, the meaning. <laughs> But fly me to the moon, this guy is a piece of work. <laughs> He's a jerk of the highest caliber because he betrays Shinji at the... He, Shinji is at the lowest point he can be at the beginning of this episode. Exactly. And this guy comes in as the white knight. He's a, He wants to be a friend of Shinji. He wants to be... Uh, He's being friendly. It's so friendly. They spend the night in each other they, in, in his in Kaoru's room. I'm assuming at Nerve. Sorry, yeah. Nerve. I got to say it right. Nerve. Nerve. <laughs> Nerve. <laughs> and Grant, I could see how in other cult, other circles, this would be seen as something romantic. I'm just seeing it as a sleepover because they're two guys. Hmm. Sleepovers were still a thing that were done as teenagers. Yeah. Not as often with guys, but... That is true. Shinji didn't want to go home, and I can't really blame him. No. Well, he probably should have because Masada was worried sick, but yeah. Shinji doesn't know or care about that. Yeah. <laughs> I understand Shinji's point of view. I'm also saying he should have gone home. Yeah, agree. More, for more, more than one reason. Mm -hmm. But as soon as he wakes up, Kaoru starts betraying... Shinji and Nerve, and I will say kudos to the writers, Hideaki Yano and, uh, what's the other guy? Uh, come up, come up. <laughs> <laughs> I can find it now. Uh, Hideaki Yano and Akio Satsukawa. Mm -hmm. They did such a good job of yeah. introducing this character Making us feel somewhat mm -hmm. like this character, making us trust this guy. Yeah. To betray, betray, having the character betray us and Shinji. Yeah, he betrayed us too, by the way. Yeah. He betrayed Shinji and us mm -hmm. to everybody. He became the worst kind of bad guy. Not, mm -hmm. not in like, I don't want bad guys like this, but the worst type of villain. Yeah. The, He's the, the, the worst kind of the worst villain. Basically, yeah. the betrayer of trust. Like a and he does that with everyone to the point where it's like, oh, Shinji, kill him, kill him, kill him. I sent you a picture when I, when I was watching this, mm -hmm. when we get to that long oh, period yeah, where yeah, he's yeah. holding him, I go, just <laughs> do something already. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. And the thing is, I because like I said, I have seen clips from the show and I've seen that shot. Mm hmm of what I just thought was Ava Unit 1 getting ready to punch somebody. Nope. Because I didn't know what, <laughs> there was somebody in his hand when I was watching when I was watching those right. clips. And I'm watching it going, do something! <laughs> Finally, the I'm not kidding. The minute I hit the shutter button on my phone to take that picture, mm -hmm. plop. <laughs> it's like, I'm the one who did it, not you, Shinji! <laughs> It was my shutter to pop the huzzah! I have killed the betrayer. <laughs> down with Nerve. Down with Zayle. <laughs> oh my gosh! Uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. Be like uh, I hate this guy. Kar Kar I love Karu. It's just like so, as a character, he is very well written. Yes, agreed. I enjoy what they did. I, I understand why this is here, and I enjoy the fact that they had the guts to do mm. this in the last episode. Oh, yeah. Basically, the last episode. Yeah. I know it's not the last episode. Yes. And honestly, it makes sense that the last angel would be a human. I did not actually see that coming. Mm. I missed all the, the, the pre 
uh, the, the the foreshadowing. Yeah. I did not see that he was sitting on an angel statue. Mm -hmm. All I know is I get to that point and it becomes, oh, he's an angel mm -hmm. after Sele starts going crazy with all the things they tell him in, at the lake. And going, oh, that's clever. At some, mm -hmm. I guess that makes sense. Oh, at some point, agreed. you would have to go with a human form for the angel. Because honestly, a, hu a human it was the only thing that was ever going to get down there. Mm -hmm. Agreed. <laughs> if we're being honest. Yes. And granted, the, the computer actually got very close. Uh, the computer virus one. Yes. But I like the character and I hate the character. You know what I mean? Fair. <laughs> I enjoy why he's there. I hate this character mm -hmm. <laughs> because of what he does, not just to Shinji, but to us, because they mm -hmm. make us trust him. You aren't experiencing that at this point because mm -hmm. you knew what was going to happen. Yeah. I did not. Yeah. I was sitting there which going, is good, which is all, a good thing to say. All you hinted at to me was that there was a character in this episode mm -hmm. who was going to die. Introduce mm -hmm. this who's going to die at the end mm -hmm. of the episode. And sure, the minute he shows up, I go. Kauru, of course. He definitely has red shirt energy. He has red eyes. He does have, and, and red right. blood as we see at the end. Yeah. Uh, or is that red LCL fluid? That's red CL fluid. <laughs> orange. Orange juice. Orange juice. Very orange, orange juice. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Almost red. Anyway, cherry orange juice. Uh, <laughs> I don't know where I'm going with that. But it's like, I like the character. I like why he's there, and I hate him. He's, they, Okay, so I've, I've had an issue up to this. I've not talked mm -hmm. about it. Not really, but I don't really like most of the characters in this show. Fair. So kudos to Hideaki Yano for being able to write a character who I hate more than everybody else and makes everybody else look like saints in comparison. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm including Gendo in that statement. Wow, that's, that's a bold statement right there. Because as bad as Gendo is... Mm -hmm. He's smart enough to at least play the long game. He, as much as Shinji is trying to get his approval throughout most of this episode, yeah. the series, you can see Gendo's number from the very beginning. He's only using Shinji because he's the only one who can pilot that Ava. Mm -hmm. Well, he claims Ray can do it, but you know, after a point, that doesn't work anymore. Yeah. After, you know became Hitler. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, oh. I still hate you, but you're not actually as bad as Kaoru as a character, yes, except I like I said, that confusing point at the end where it's like, you know, I like you people so much. I want you to be the ones that live. Boy, kill me now. It's like, what? 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 Yeah, that made no sense. <laughs> what? Like you, you, you went down you, there to cause third you, impact. The third impact is supposed to happen. It's you're all supposed to be your fault. And no, no. So, it's like, oh, oh, because be like in the Ediva, because apparently there was this big controversy because they didn't go into the the heterosexual homosexual. Yeah, the Netflix one does not go into no, that it at all. It doesn't. But the AD the AD uh, director's cut does, and it's just more be like he just be like, oh, I love you, Shinji. That's what he says, and then. Shinji is more mixed feelings that he doesn't know what's going on because he's being freaking manipulated. Thank you very much. That's my whole point. Yes. So be like with, with that said, be like, there's a lot of people. It's like, well, they didn't do this and this and this. It's like, that's so, not important to the story. He no, still betrayed not. Shinji. Exactly. He played with his feelings, whether it's romantic or whether it's platonic. Yeah. It does not matter. Agreed. He is a word i do not want to say on the show <laughs> Bichon for say there is a word i could actually use on the show that is in english butthole <laughs> butthole is the nicest term i can use here okay i want to use worse language uh, fair. but i am being recorded <laughs> and what i say <laughs> can and will be used <laughs> against me by somebody agreed and this guy is a butthole of the highest caliber. And I. All the way, in the, all the way. In the, never mind. Go ahead. Strangely enough, I didn't care that he died. I did. I was like, wow. I know you were happy. He's like, yeah, you got rid of that son of a. But I'm sitting there going, dude, this guy is so horrible. My, my feelings on this guy. 
mm-hmm. first time viewing, my feelings are, I don't really know how to feel about you doing that whole thing, even though I kind of don't like you at the moment. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it's like, oh, he's dead. Mm-hmm. And then my, the, my thoughts show back to just like every other angel who I didn't care about. Mm-hmm. Because none of the other, other angels were presented as being intellectual. Yes. This one is. And so in some degree, I'm glad he's dead. Also, he's a person. Or he's presented as a person. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, oh, does he actually deserve to die as a person? What did he actually, besides betraying Shinji, which is a horrible thing to do. Don't get it's me wrong. Totally he's an angel, so. Right. But he's. And he, he did he did he actually kill anyone? No. And immediately at the end, he just technically it it's su- he commits suicide basically, even though he's doing kind it of. through Shinji. Yeah, he wants to die and is wanting Shinji to kill him. Yes, because apparently only either angels or as he calls them, Lilins mm-hmm. can live. Can, can, can be everyone else, the other, all yeah. the other group has to die. And he's decided he wants it to be the little ones who live. So please kill me, Shinji. Mm-hmm. And going, you have worth, Kaoru. <laughs> as much as Shinji has worth, as much right. as Asuka has worth, mm-hmm. as much as Rei and all her freaking clones mm-hmm. all have worth. And none of them should have gone through any of the crap they went through which I'm going to get into this later in in the, in the next episode, by okay. the way, because okay. I have an opinion at the end of that, because of it's course. like, you could have done something cool here, Hideyaki. I know what you didn't. <laughs> I, thought I was- both am happy to see him die, and I kind of also wish I he didn't have to die. They could have found some way for a redemption story. Not that we had time for that. No. Because we only had two episodes after this. No. But at the same time, it's like, could we have done something? <laughs> Hinted at something? It's like, let him go off to the moon so we didn't have to see him anymore? Let him fly to the moon? <laughs> uh, Moving on. Yes. Great episode. Enrage inducing. Uh, fly me to the moon, like Drew said. Fly me to the freaking moon. Yeah. I was happy when Karu got his freaking head popped. I loved it. That was like, great. That being Good said, riddance. That being said, I need to get you some clips from a certain YouTube show that I've watched because I think you'll enjoy them. <laughs> okay, gotcha. I'll have to edit some stuff out that you won't care about that's not Evangelion related, but... <laughs> roger, roger. Anyway... I think that's going to be it for this episode okay. of the Cellcast. Yes. Join us next week where, along with our stupidest decision we've probably ever made, nah, nah just our most controversial. If you say it's controversial, is it still controversial? Yes. Okay, we'll go with that. Along with Song of the South, we are going to be finishing Evangelion with what I am calling the most uh, despair-inducing PowerPoint presentation on the face of the planet. Mm. It's more than that, but Agreed. there is a lot of reused animation of and course. random pictures. Not most of them, not some of them, not even animated. Just some, apparently someone went and took and then applied mm-hmm. a fake half tone thing to make it look like newspaper. Yes. But either way, the join us next. Ep- the last two episodes of Evangelion are very interesting mm. and odd. We'll get there when yeah, we, we get, get there, there next week. In the meantime, this has been Drew. This is Jacob. And we'll catch you in the next frame. You can follow Jacob on his Facebook at Jacob B. Heron. His Facebook page, Jacob's Daily Art Corner, where he tries to draw each and every day. His Instagram at Jacob B. Heron. His Twitter at Jacob Heron. And his letterbox to Jacob Heron. You can find Drew on Facebook at Drew Dodgen. His Facebook page, Drew's Photo Bin, to see his photography. His letterbox page at GGeorge759. His Twitter at GGeorge759. And Instagram at Drew Dodgen. You can like us on Facebook at The Cellcast Podcast. On Twitch at The Cellcast Gaming. On YouTube at Cellcast. On Twitter at Cast underscore Cell. The Cellcast can be found at Apple Podcasts. Google Play Podcasts. Stitcher. Spotify. Or anywhere else fine podcasts are downloaded from. Please rate and review us where you found us and also on Podchaser. 
Email us at thecellcastpodcast at gmail.com. The Cellcast is a proud member of both the Pop Americana and Culture Box Media Networks. For more information, please see the link in the description. Our theme song is Drop and Roll by Silent Partner. And remember, that's Cell with a single L. Up again. <laughs> That's so wrong. That is so wrong. <laughs>